Hey folks, thanks for checking out Missio Church in Manor, Iowa. You are listening to audio recorded at our Sunday morning service. If you'd like any more information on the gospel or would like to learn more about Missio Church, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Missio Mount Air. Um, I'll invite you to get your Bibles out and to turn with me to Luke chapter 16 this morning. Uh, we're not quite wrapping up our little mini-series on... We didn't officially title this, I guess, what it means to be a Christian. We, our idea was to go through the outcomes. And, and, and so we didn't officially title this, what it means to be a Christian. But we've kind of, it's kind of evolved into that, sort of under that banner, under that heading. And, and next week, uh, Jim is going to kind of wrap up all that we've discussed over the last eight weeks uh, for us, going to summarize kind of all of it into one uh, cohesive message. So uh, before I get started, let's read uh, the text here. This is Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Luke 16, verses 10 through 13. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is, not, that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God stands forever. So we've been on kind of an incredible journey the last eight weeks, as I've said, trying to get down to the essentials of what does it mean practically, really, to be a Christian what does it mean that we call ourselves Christian? Is that just a title that we take upon ourselves as we go around because we live by a certain kind of worldview or, a, you know, try to be good people or some sort of, you know, bland moral code or whatever? What does it mean? It's a box that we check when we fill out the survey. What does it mean to be a Christian? We've spoken, we started out on just the message of what is the gospel, that we spoke on how the gospel message first makes a Christian, that it takes someone out from underneath the condemnation that their sin has deserved them, that all mankind in their natural state deserves. It takes the individual who is condemned under uh, the justice and the judgment of God, and it reconciles them back to God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, in their place, condemns, condemned he stands, and seals our pardon with his blood, the hymn writer says. And the gospel message is the good news that takes sinners and reconciles them back to their creator. And then those people, as they have been saved by the gospel, they now follow Jesus. They become followers of him. They become his disciples. They seek to, to live and to be conformed to his image, and they are born into a family. They are adopted into God's family. They now have brothers and sisters to walk alongside of them as they seek Jesus. So those who are then marked, bent, those that are, that are saved by the gospel, following after him, purchased and adopted into this family, they then uh, follow, our, their lives are marked by certain characteristics. And we summarize them in five characteristics. We call them the five outcomes of discipleship, right? Those certain characteristics are communing with God, walking by the Spirit, sharing God's grace, serving with spiritual gifts, and stewarding life generously. And those are the five kind of headings that we've said that if you've been saved by the gospel and you're following after Jesus and you're part of the, the body of Christ called the church, then these five things will mark your life. You will commune with God daily. In his word, through prayer, you will be seeking to commune more and more and walk in fellowship with God. You'll be seeking to walk by the Spirit, putting sin to death, 
killing the deeds of the flesh and seeking to walk by the Spirit in a way that magnifies God. And then as you commune with Him and walk by the Spirit, you will then, last week I talked about, you will speak of Him, you will serve like Him, and you will steward for Him. Sharing God's grace that while we're out in the world, the message of the gospel goes forward not just from the paid professional up front, or the, per, or the track that we airdrop from the sky or something into the crowd or whatever. Neither one of those, I guess, is whatever. The way the gospel goes forward, uh, like, well, we could have an interesting discussion. Anyway, the, the way the gospel goes forward is by the people of God speaking about him. That each one of us, as we've gathered here this morning, now goes out and is mobilized and equipped and empowered and encouraged to take this gospel message and share it with your circle of accountability with the people around you. You speak of him. You serve with your spiritual gifts. And that means that they are the gifts that we have and we use in the power of the spirit for the betterment of the body of Christ and for the good of the world. And now this week we're talking about stewarding life generously. This week, stewarding life generously. Now, generally, when I have preached on this before, I've approached the topic from kind of the the large angle of we need to steward all of life generously, which is absolutely what our conviction is. This is not just, this this is everything that we have, we have received from God. Psalm 24 says that, the, the, the fullness of God, all, everything belongs to him. Everything is God's and what we have, we have, we have received from his fullness. Everything belongs to him and we exist as stewards. And so our time, our resources, our, our finances, our homes, our energies, our relationships, everything we do, everything we have is meant to be stewarded or leveraged for, for him, we're talking about stewarding all of life. And so usually, um, because this is such an all-inclusive outcome, we've stood back and, and talked about big general principles and then hoped that you would apply it to very specific instances in your life. Well, uh, this morning, I'm going to reverse that. Um, at the request of some members of the church community, I've had some people come to me and they say, can you talk, instead of broadly, can you talk very specifically? So just as there, so this morning, we are going to look at the specific application and then let you work on seeing how that individual perspective flows out into the rest of your life. It's like you can, you can appreciate the craftsmanship on a house in a couple of different ways. You can walk by and, and look at the whole building and see, you know, that's a, that's a really well done, beautiful building. And then as you walk closer and closer, you begin to pick out little details and little, you know, nice little flourishes that you notice and begin to appreciate. That's one way to appreciate a building. Another way to appreciate it is to go straight to the decorative banister or the crown molding or whatever, the, the, the detail around the fireplace or something and see the very small, intricate uh, effort put into this specific thing and then as you back out you begin to be blown away by how this level of detail fills the hole and so this morning that's what we're going to be doing in talking about stewarding life generously we're going to talk specifically about money about finances now what's interesting at least to me is that Anytime I've come to approach a sermon, this was planned uh, months ago, by the way. So, like, there's nothing, this was just like the fact that we are in this rentless small little room, like, has nothing to do with, like, we need to talk about money, folks. That is total coincidence. That, that is, those, those do not correlate in our mind. They just happen to be a, a circumstance that's happened. But anytime that it has come that, I, that I've got a, a sermon that has anything to do with money, the months leading up to it, have, my days have been filled with conversations, not filled, that's exaggeration. I've had several conversations with people where they will complain to me about, I went to this church and all the pastor could talk about was money. All the pastor wanted was my money. And I get tired of going to churches and all they talk about is money. And so, or it'll be the Sunday coming up that I know some new people, some new acquaintances I've met. This is the Sunday, this is the first Sunday they're going to show up and they're going to hear me talk about money. <laughs> and, and I, and here we are. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you know, and so it always then causes me to be shy, but, but, When it comes to this specific local church, I can say with clear conscience, 
that this is, church is not built to line the greedy pockets of its pastors. There, and, and say that with full honesty. Jim and I, as the paid elders on staff, have salaries that, just to kind of ease the, to leave the ick factor off the table, Jim and I, as the paid elders, we combined have a salary that maybe equals a part-time person. Like, there, there's no, like, uh, there's, there's nothing about what we're doing here that is somehow uh, enabling us to drive our big fancy cars and park them in our big fancy garages attached to our big fancy mansions that we live in when we're not off on big fancy vacations on our private jets. <laughs> that ain't happening here, okay? So there's, there's no need to be worried about that. We, in fact, aren't even in charge of our salaries. That is set by our advisory team, which is a group of, of ministry professionals and just other other, uh, other leaders in our community, uh, Andy Kellner and uh, Eric Friedrich, sit on our advisory team right now. Andy's here somewhere, isn't he? Oh, my gosh, she's standing in the back. Andy and Eric, they're on, they're on this advisory team. They help set our salaries, okay? So I just mentioned this because to try to relieve some of the, the ick factor in talking about our money and giving to the church. But I do want to say this. Going after our mission statement does take resources. If we want to see God glorified and we want to see all of Christ's people equipped and, and uh, to worship Him with all of their lives, and we want to see every man, woman, and child reached with the gospel, have repeated opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel, that does take resources. The reason why Jim and I are willing to work for our local congregation for a smaller salary is because we deeply believe in the mission of, and the work of God in this place. And we are willing to sacrifice to see that go forward. Right? We both are willing to take on outside work to provide for our families so that we can stay in this geography and be about the mission of God in this place for the benefit of the local body and for the growth of the gospel into the world. So we're both willing to do that and to sacrifice. But full disclosure, it would be really awesome to have a bunch of us, to have a church so bought into this mission and so, get, so, uh, so wired in and behind this purpose that we are here for, that we are giving into this mission so that we would be able to staff Jim, myself, Nina, and who knows who else to really invest their lives in chasing after what God wants for Ringgold County in Southwest Iowa. So just indulge me for a moment. Imagine with me if we had 30 giving units, 30 families and individuals that gave regularly 10% of their income. That historically is called like a tithe. You've heard that word tithe maybe. It just simply is a word that means 10th. And out of Numbers chapter uh, 18, verse 21, you see, you see this begin to be referenced, the idea of a tithe. It's nothing legally ob uh, obligated for you to give a tenth of a percent. It's just historically has been an understanding of giving a percentage of your income to the people of God. So if we had 30 families with an average median income of, say, $75,000, giving 10%, a tithe of their income, the church budget we would have would be $225,000 per year to see to go after this mission. To get, it's not up there, sorry. Not the Stewarding Life Generously mission. The mission that we, said, we spoke of earlier, to go after together. So my heart on this, again, here, it is not to build a giant building, though sometimes you think it'd be nice to have a place to go. Our heart is not to build a giant building, not to bid big fat monuments to ourselves or to congratulate ourselves, but our heart in talking about this is that to give ourselves resources to go after the mission of equipping Christ's people and engaging and reaching every man, woman, and child. How incredible, right now Jim works, I know he can plug your ears, Jim, Right now, Jim works very hard at, at going out to these other churches. He's got other coaching uh, uh, engagements that he's involved in and, and giving of his time. And, and these churches are, are bringing him on to help grow them. What an incredible thing it would be if we could be so postured that because we want to see this this, this uh, care for our geography, go to the regions around us, that we could send Jim and say, you know what, this is on us. We will, we will foot the bill for him, that we've got the resources to invest in him, to send him to enlarge the mission. Wouldn't it be great to have someone else on staff even that could join him and go for him at times so we continue to expand the mission? There's so much to be done. 
Think of the impact that could be made right here locally with empowered people and intentional resourcing. And I could go on and on. So I just want to say, kind of clear our consciences. We are, we are not about uh, pilfering pockets in this congregation. In fact, this is the first sermon in a lot of years. Almost negligent to talk about money out of ca Midwest caution to never speak about money in public. <laughs> but at the same time, we do seriously want to chase the mission and the purpose of God in this community, which does require resourcing, which does mean lots of people on the oars rowing together. Okay, so, all right. Why do we want to steward life generously, particularly in regards to our finances? What answer would you give if someone asked, why do you give to the church? Like, what would be, what would be an answer? Why do you, as, a, as if you're a giver, why, why give to the church? What answer would you give? And I want to talk, first of all, about a couple of, of uh, why nots to give. Because there's, there are a couple of general answers. One of the replies, there's some variation of, of this thought. We give because the church needs money to run. Organizations need funds to keep going, so we do our part. We, why not to give? Because the church needs money. Well, Paul here in 1 Corinthians 13, this is the famous love chapter here. But Paul says something very interesting about the idea of money. If we're, if we're giving only because, well, the church needs money, Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, he says, if I give away all that I have, so like if you're holding back nothing but giving every dollar to the mission of God, and I deliver up my body even to be burned, so you're willing to give me martyrdom even, but I have not love, I gain nothing. If the motivation is just, well, the church needs it, so I'll give it, but there's no love behind it, it's not the, it, that's no, that is no beneficial reason to give. We do not give merely because, well, the church, we, this is an organization like any other organization. It needs money to run, so we'll give to it. No. Paul says that's pointless. You, it's, you're a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal if you just give because the church needs it and not because there's a love motivation behind it. Or maybe we say we give because, well, I know I should. I know I should give. Well, Paul also kind of uh, addresses that, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, in the section here on giving. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, that each one must give as he is decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. So the, the heartbeat here this morning as well is not to guilt a bunch of you into giving money to the church. There is, because if it's just because the church needs money, uh, you're a noisy gong. If it's just because you ought to, there's no cheerful giving, and God is not honored in that. We're looking for something deeper here. We're looking at something deeper, and our desire is for something deeper. So if that's the why not to give, let's give three whys to give. You ought to give because of your own heart. This really is, is such a practical issue that we think that money is about some just tertiary issue of like these resources we have. But when, and really, again, to broaden that out, stewarding life is not just about some sort of disconnected use of resources. It is very closely tied to the state, state of your heart. Where, where is your heart focused? What are you going after? What do you care about? Why give? Because of your heart. Proverbs 23, verses 4 through 5. Proverbs 23. Sorry, we're going to jump around quite a bit here this morning. We're not working through any specific text. Proverbs 23, verses 4 through 5 says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, that is wealth, it's gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. How many people are familiar with this proverb? That the minute you begin to focus on money, all of a sudden it sprouts wings and it flies away. I only make money to see it go out. I bring money in so that it can just go out. A very true proverb. But it, So then if, if our hearts begin to become so centered around our money, we're centering and anchoring our lives around something that is so fleeting and so temporary that it flies away into the sky like an eagle taking off toward heaven. Worldly wealth is too fleeting of a possession to anchor your hopes in it. 
That's what this Luke 16 passage we read this morning was about. Your heart cannot be devoted to God and money. One will win the day. And this is a parallel, there's a parallel passage to that statement in Matthew chapter 6. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. We've preached through this a, a year or so or two ago, a while ago. We preached through the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 Jesus preaching here, the Sermon on the Mount, says this, Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The statement from Jesus that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, is a convicting passage. Why give for your, the sake of your own heart, where is your heart placed? Is your heart caught up with, with specifically this morning, your bank account or any sort of resources we could broaden it out to? But is your heart caught up in what you're able to buy for yourself, the security you find in your purchases and tied up in your money? Because Jesus is saying, you cannot serve that and God at the same time. If your life is bowed down to your bank account and to every miserly dollar you can hold on to, you cannot be bowed down to God. Your idol, God may help serve you in getting more of your idol, but one of them will rule over your life. As you give a Jesus, the statement from Jesus, where your treasure is, there your heart will be, is convicting. We know that your heart will follow your attention. What you give attention to, your heart follows. Um, I, I play fantasy sports not well, and it's kind of funny. How do you play fantasy sports? I don't know. You just pick people. And you, you, don't, you don't play anything. <laughs> you don't actually do anything except pick out, pick out people. But one of the things that I enjoy about fantasy sports is that you do pick different individuals that you wouldn't necessarily pick out. To, to, they, you put them on your roster. And as you give them attention and you're paying attention to their stats, you find like affection for them begins to inc- You want to see them do well because you want your fantasy team to do well, sure. But, but what you give your attention to your affection begins to grow for. And so in the same way, when your money is leveraged towards the things of this life and you're giving your attention in that way, your affection begins to grow that way. And so we want to care about what we do with our money because we care about our hearts. And so when we give towards the purposes of God, when we invest our money in the church and what God is doing in the world, where we are giving our attention increases our affection. We're storing up treasure for ourselves in heaven. Giving toward God's mission in the world makes you a tangible participant in in what God is doing. Withholding from giving shrivels your own heart. 1 Timothy 6.10 is a real warning that the love of money pulls many away from the faith. Fight against the pull of money for your affections. Our world and our capitalistic society and our prosperity loves money. Loves what money can get us. And Paul says it clearly to Timothy, for many, this love of money actually has drawn them away from the faith because you cannot serve two masters. Fight against the pull of money for your affections, praying that you give more, get that, that, that more than I want from the things this money can give me, I want to see God made much of. So we give because of our heart, we give because of our reward. We'll just fly through this one. But first, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul talks very interestingly about the Philippian church that their giving is adding to their eternal reward. That there is in some way, this isn't a salvific thing. You cannot buy your salvation in the church. But there is something very interesting, it's fun to study out, that is talking about that this giving in this life does increase your investment in the kingdom here and now, does in some I don't, a mysterious way in add to your reward in, in, in eternity. There's an understanding with Paul, one that he is unapologetic about, that there is the possibility of increasing your reward in heaven. And one way is by storing your treasure there rather than here. And lastly, we give because of God's glory. Jamie Dunlop in his booklet on church giving, a little nine marks booklet on church giving, a lot of this outline has come from there, but He says this, this is a quote from him. He says, The Christian who gladly gives of her or his material wealth shows off her or his love for Jesus 
and the extravagant spiritual wealth she's or he's received in him. Every time you give, you're making a statement that God is better than anything else you could have done with that money. That's a fascinating, that's a great statement. <laughs> every time you give, we give because we care about God's glory. And every time you give, you're making a statement that God is better than anything else you could have done with that money. Giving to support your local church says something eternal about the goodness of God. And you can see how this is all part of our mission statement. We want to be people who give because it points to the high value of God. We exist to glorify God, <laughs> right? We exist to glorify God. And so our giving points to his high value more than we value the things of this world. It resources the reaching of every man, woman, and child, and it resources the equipping of all of Christ's people. So we've looked at the why not. We looked at the why. How about the where? Okay, let's think quickly through why the local church is a good where for your giving. The local church is a good place. Why give to the local church? The local church seeks to minister to you. Teaching, praying, leading, listening, encouraging, challenging, edifying, correcting, caring. All of these things, the church exists for the, for the common good of its people. And so when you're giving to your local church in a real way, you are supporting the system that is here to support you, <laughs> that is here to benefit you. So we give to the local church, speci church specifically because the local church seeks to minister to you. We give to the local church because it is a sure investment. Jesus is building his church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is no better return on investment than the church of Jesus Christ because his mission will not fail. And so when we give money, when we give of our resources, when we give our, our kitchen tables up, when we give our evenings up, when we give our vehicles up, when we give our time up, when we invest in a relationship, we wanted to go uh, read a book some evening and instead we call somebody up and have a conversation with them and pray with them and we, we steward our life and every aspect towards the kingdom. It's a sure investment because that kingdom will not fail and it will it will reach its full maturity. It's a perfect return on its investment. And we give to the local church because the local church is important. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, the manifold wisdom of God is put on display in the local church. So, we've done the why not. We've done the why because of our hearts, because of, the, because of God's glory, because of something else that I can't think of as I stand in front of you. Oh, because of your reward. <laughs> that was the other one. I skipped through it. Uh, we looked at the why, the where, so now the how. And just, uh, I really want you to hear the heart of this. We want to get practical. This, this is such a clear issue. It, it is so easy to dis discern. Am I doing this? Am I not? Like so many things, communing with God, they're kind of become, I think there are clear distinctions we can do with that, but, but they all become kind of abstract at some level. This one really is hard to kind of abstract. It's just kind of black and white. And so, we're, so it's, it's a great place to be able to look at, engage, where is my heart? What am I really serving? What do I really care about? It's just a black and white area that can be so helpful to say, you know, in this area, it's pretty clear, I've got some growth that needs to happen. Or I can celebrate what God has done in me. So we've looked at the why, we've looked at the where, but now just to get into the brass tacks of the how. How do we give? Well, I've got four things up there. The first one isn't really about giving, but it's about spending responsibly. This is such, oh, this is so popular in our world today. <laughs> if, you thought, if you thought the sermon was kind of dragging now, now we get to the point, be responsible with your finances. Uh, but we live in a world that needs to hear this. We live in a consumeristic expressive individualistic age where all of my money goes towards satisfying me. And so it, it's kind of obvious you cannot give to the church if every dollar you have goes towards yourself and your pursuits and your desires. So how to give, spend responsibly. Spending less on things you don't need will obviously free up money to spend on things that matter. I love reading about the victory gardens in World War II whenever something like, was it 60 or 
of, of, the, of the garden vegetables that were consumed in America were raised in victory gardens during World War II, meaning that we all, not just Andy and trying to crowd a, get a crowd to go to the community garden, but we all had community gardens in our backyards growing vegetables and, and everything we could to, to can and to save and to feed ourselves so that we wouldn't steal from the resources that are going towards the armies overseas. And so we were taking care, we were, we were on a mission, we were convinced of something, and so we took responsibility with the money that we had. Spend less on things you don't need. Don't take on debt for things you don't need. Don't get upside down on your finances. Do you need accountability in this area? Then thinking about, think about including this conversation in your discipleship environments with someone you trust to be confidential. Budget the money God has given you. Don't throw money away. Um, we've been watching the NBA games. Um, we still like the NBA and, uh, Darn it, the Pacers are down 3 nothing. if you didn't know that. That's, that's, we were kind of rooting for the Pacers. That, that's unfortunate. Jazz is out, which is my team, and so it doesn't really matter. But uh, I like the Jazz because I'm a glutton for punishment. Okay, that's, and that's why I also like the Bills. <laughs> I like to lose a lot, I guess. Uh, but we've been watching the NBA Finals, and every other commercial is trying to get you to gamble your money away. It, has, it, is, it is insane the amount of pressure that is being put on our young people today to throw your money away, hoping to get a big pile back. And kids, it is a real, and then, and those commercials, they're almost only broken up by the commercials about fighting gambling addiction. <laughs> it's really kind of a funny dichotomy there. God is not honored when you hoard, when God, is, God is not honored when you throw your money away, even when you do it in the hopes of getting a big pile back. And I know, I know how the human brain works. I know how the, the young man's brain works, at least at some level. And they think, well, but if I get a big pile of money back, I'll give half of it to the church. I don't, we don't want your, we don't want your gambling money. Like if you win the Powerball and you get $25 million, don't bring half of it to me. It's, it, that's a tax on the poor. It is, it is not honoring to God to gamble, your, to play with chances. Make wise investments. Don't play games with chances with your resources. Spend responsibly so that we can give towards the furthering of the mission of God, okay? So spend responsibly. God honors those who earn their money honestly, not desperately and through chance. So spend responsibly in life. But secondly, give in proportion to your income. Christians live under the conviction that everything is God and all that we have has come from his fatherly hand. God is not honored if you go out and take a high interest loan so that you can give a big chunk to the church. Hey, I'm going I'm to go take out a high interest loan so I can give a big bunch of money to the church and aren't I, aren't I honoring God? No, you give in proportion to your income. But God is also not honored when you hoard what he has given to you to, you, to steward when you hoard it for yourself and your worldly desires. Don Whitney, in his uh, book on spiritual disciplines, the section on giving, he asked, I think, a really good, tough question. I wish I could take credit for it, but this is Don Whitney asking this, and you can also get mad at him for asking it, not me. He says, the question to ask is not, how much of my money should I give to God, but how much of God's money, God's money, should I keep for myself? The question isn't, how much of my money should I give to God, but how much of God's money that he's given me to steward should I keep for myself? Give in proportion to your income. Give regularly. 1 Corinthians 16.1, Paul gives instructions for the giving of an offering. They were to gather it on the first day of the week so that they had something to give to the saints that were suffering. Give regularly. George Mueller, uh, famous uh, Mueller of Bristol, uh, famous kind of... Uh, minister, uh, he says this in regards to finances and, and giving regularly. I think I have a quote there. He says, are you giving systematically to the Lord's work or are you leaving it to feeling, to impressions made upon you through particular circumstances or to striking appeals? If we do not give from principle systematically, we shall find that our one brief life is gone before we are aware of it and that in return we have done little for that adorable one who has bought us with his precious blood and to whom belongs all we have and are. And he's saying if you just wait around for the spirit to move you to, oh, you know what, today I've got, oh, I found an extra 20 in my pocket. I'm going to give it. If you wait for that, you'll find those moments few and far between. And so he calls, the, God's people are called to give regularly, to, to, to intentionally 
set up, do I have intentionally on there, to set up our, a, a portion of our money intentionally and regularly that this is something I want to be a part of and I want to give to. And so I'm systematically, regularly giving to the church. It's like reading a book. It's amazing how much of a book you can get read if you just take five pages a day. Over the course of several months, you find yourself having read nice big books. In the same way, with our, if we do that with books, why can we not do that with finances? Instead of waiting for the week to read the whole giant tome, set aside regular times of giving, and you'll find yourself to be a charitable giver over time. And lastly, give sacrificially. Polling shows that 5% of churchgoers give. I pulled it out in 2021, so that's three years ago. But 5% of churchgoers give to their local church. And 50% of those givers give 2% of their income. If we were back at our model of $75,000, that'd be about 25 bucks a week that a churchgoer gives. We pay more for our internet. We pay more... I pay more for a stop at Starbucks. Like, that's, that place is outrageous. We pay more for our internet. We pay more for a stop for junk food. Jesus commends the widow in Luke 21, not for the amount she gave, but because she gave sacrificially. The Macedonians in 1 Corinthians 9, they gave out of their joy and their poverty. Giving to the work of God is not meant to endanger your family or bankrupt you by no means. But if it is only the amount of money that you can afford to drop at a Starbucks or entertaining some side hobby, we really need to question our hearts. Again, I, I want to, all of this conversation has been an effort at some level, I hope you can hear this, to think about what is my heart posture towards God with the things that I have? Is my life leveraged to glorify God in every area? And specifically to this morning, yes, money, but in every area, this broadens out to everything. Our desire is to be a group of people who do not gather just for a nice program on a Sunday morning and sing together and kind of share our donuts and all these things that are great. But our desire is to be a people who truly are on mission together, love what God has done for us in the giving of himself, and therefore our hearts are burdened that with all that we have, we would give in response to all that has been given to us. Honestly, I want you to consider this area because I care about your heart. Our world is pulled back and forth and into destruction by its love of money. I feel the pull, and I know that you do too. But God has given us something greater to live for. God has given us himself. And now as his adopted children, stewarding what he has given us, let us in our joy leverage all that we have as effectively as we can for the glory of his name. Not serving, trying to serve two masters, but serving the one true master that is Lord over all. Let's pray. Father, as we've taken this morning's time to talk on stewarding life generously, specifically with finances, God, I pray that you would just do the heart work here, God, for us. We ask that the Spirit would convict us that we'd be challenged, that, God, we would be provoked to be about the things that you're about, God, to not just talk about them, but to be about them. <laughs> God, we want to be about your purposes in this world, and we want to leverage, God, we want to be a people who are stewarding all of life generously for the furthering of the gospel in our community, for the equipping of all of your people, and for your glory overall. And so, Father, would you just take these these feeble efforts this morning to convict us, to draw us closer to you, to, God, form us into your image because it is where our greatest joy is found when our treasure is found not in this world but in you and in you alone. We pray these things in Jesus' name.